Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first lecture in our 2021 lecture series entitled Vision for Souls, um, Vision and Spirituality in Barbados. Today, we are joined by Reverend Jewel Callender, and our lecture will be chaired by Dr. Um, Rodney World. Um, just reminding you of a few housekeeping rules, all comments and conversations must be placed in the chat. Um, if you have any questions for Reverend Callender at the end of her lecture, you can feel free to put them in the question and answer feature and that is located at the bottom of your screen. And as a courtesy, all panelists will be muted um, when they join the, the Zoom. Um, and now I'm going to hand things over to Dr. Rodney Worrell, who will introduce himself and then introduce our lecture. So, Dr. Worrell. Thank you very much. Um, good evening. Um, I want to send a, a warm welcome to the presenter, the Reverend Joel Callender, and to you, the audience. Um, yeah, my name is Rodney Worrell. I'm a lecturer in history, in the Department of History and Philosophy at University of the West Indies Cape. Well, so yeah, I wish you um, a very warm welcome and, and hopefully, yeah, um, we, will be, we will be blessed after this evening's presentation. I want to thank also the, the sponsors of this lecture series and the sponsors for this evening's lecture, the Barbados Museum and Historical Society and the History Department, or I should say the Department of History and Philosophy, um, University of the West Indies, UFO campus. And the team of this year's lecture series is Fighting for Souls, Spirituality and Religion in Barbados. So over the next seven weeks or so, lecturers in this series, right, they, over the next seven or so weeks, the lecturers in this series will take Barbadians and those who are listening on the journey on the history, development, and the context of religion inside of Barbados. And for many years, one was told that Barbados was uh, a, a religious space, a Christian society, a very tolerant space, et cetera. So over the next um, couple of weeks, you will be taken on a tour of the various religions inside of Barbados. However, to open the, the batting or the bowling in this year's lecture series is the Reverend um, Joel Callender, who will speak on fighting for ground, tensions between Anglicanism and Catholicism in early Barbados. But before she begins to speak to you, there's a, um, a little bit of um, information that you should know of her. Um, so the Reverend Joel Callender is the wife of Sean Callender and the senior pastor of the People's Cathedral where she has served in several capacities for over 25 years. From 1999 to 2001, um, she worked as a missionary at the children's village in the heart of Port-au-Prince inside of Haiti. In 2014, Mrs. Callender became the first woman elected to serve as a member at large on the district executive of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the West Indies. 
Barbados district. Raven Calendar holds a diploma in Bible and theology from the West Indies School of Theology, a Bachelor of Theology from Faith Theological Seminary and Christian College, Tampa, Florida, and a Bachelor of Arts in History and Gender Studies from the University of the West Indies PFL campus, where she gained a first class honors degree. And she is currently pursuing a master's, a master of arts in history at UWI KFL. And um, yeah, I am accustomed to yeah, the, the brilliance of Reverend Calendar because she took one or two courses with me and she was an outstanding student. So ladies and gentlemen, I give you um, Reverend Joel Calendar. I thank you. You're still muted. You're still muted, um, Rev. Sorry, good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you, Dr. Rorill, for your introduction and your kind words that you have spoken. And it is really a privilege, and I am thankful to the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, as well as to the um, Department of History and Philosophy at the University of the West Indies for allowing me to participate in this lecture series. I think it is an important one for our country. And I believe that as we go through the lecture this evening, that it, we will see it, it, it can be a benefit to each and every one of us as citizens of Barbados. As Dr. Worrell intimated, my topic this evening is fighting for ground, tensions between Anglicanism and Roman Catholicism in early Barbados. Now, the emergence of religion in Barbados is inextricably linked to British colonialization in the island in the 17th century. Therefore, the socio-political and the economic conditions that dictated how the re religious beliefs and ceremonies of the British and Irish citizens were experienced in the metropole transfer, transferred to the increasingly diverse population within Barbados at that time. And so this evening, our talk will look at the development of Anglicanism and Roman Catholicism in the colony. It will also examine the methods that were used by the Protestant or Anglican Barbadian planter class to control the religious and social practices of Roman Catholics. We will also consider how the Irish Catholics, how they experienced life, the ones who came voluntarily and those who were exiled to Barbados, what their experiences were here in Barbados in the 17th century. I want to begin by putting context to this lecture and to the topic that we are looking at this evening. And we need to do that by going right back to where it all started. It started on February 17, 1627, when the first group of settlers arrived here in Barbados to occupy what was then a deserted island. It is said that there were 80 um, settlers who came on that first trip. And the mission then was to establish a colony that would strengthen the expansion of the British Empire in the West Indies. Therefore, the souls that disembarked from the William and John ship were Captain Henry Powell, his crew. We would have also have had potential planters, mainly from the merchant class who came. It is said that there were white indentured servants on board 
and there were others, presumably um, Blacks, who would come to assist with the production of tobacco, cotton, and indigo, which would have been the principal crops at that time. At this time, I want to um, share with you some information via the PowerPoint. And as I go along, I also want to talk about the research that was done and the importance of it. These are some of the, the research materials that were looked at. Very important, but the history of Barbados by Schomburg, um, which really gives you, this is a contemporary source that was written near the, to the time when all of this would have taken place. Also, we have the Barbados Diocesan History. And this was written by two canons of the um, Anglican Church. And it was written in 1925 at the centenary of the um, Anglican, the, that centenary celebration there. Also very interesting book, The West Indian Eden, which was written by Louis Lynch. And it is called The Book of Barbados. And it gives you a concise history of what was happening in the country um, at the point in time when he wrote. Then the shaping of the West Indian church looked at the early history of Barbados, the early church history of Barbados. So um, Arthur Dayfoot would have looked at the how the church emerged in the Caribbean during that time and how it progressed. Also, another important piece of material would have been Sugar and Slave by Richard Dunn. And this actually looked at the time of slavery. But interestingly, it began before we had African slaves and looked at the indentured servants that we would have had during that time. And then, of course, a history of Barbados by Hilary Beckles. Um, it, it, it talks about the period from the Amerindian settlement to the Caribbean single market and covers a large swath of our history and all that would have taken place, some of the, the really significant things that would have happened during that time. And then another important art, uh, book that pertains to this topic of religion in Barbados, Cross and Crown in Barbados by Cartwright Davis. And Mr. Davis really captured the essence of what was happening within the church during uh, that period of time, that early period of time in Barbados and helps you to have a better understanding of what was happening here. Now, there was no native population here in Barbados when the first settlers came to oppose the plans that they've, they had in terms of settlement and in terms of progress. And it is said that the settlers painstakingly, um, you know, cleared the forest, the dense forest, because at that time Barbados was densely forested that covered this island. And they did that to facilitate the cultivation of the first cash crops being tobacco and cotton. And one historian says that they used the slash and burn method in terms of clearing the country. And so it was not a pretty sight when they were done, but they wanted to, as quickly as possible, make sure that they could clear the land in order that they could plant their crops. Historians also tell us that there were massive locusts, cedar, silk cotton, fiddlewood, poison, and mangrove trees found on the island of Barbados when the first settlers came. And this match, this map, um, that you can see here is by Legion, a very important map for historians and others who are interested in our country. And what it shows you, um, if you look to the edges, is that most of the settlement, you would see a lot of writing going along the coast. Most of the settlement was um, along the coastline because of the difficulties of clearing the dense forest from Barbados during that time. Now, Dunn tells us that between 1628 and 1630, 
approximately 40,000 acres of land was allocated to just 250 English settlers by the Earl of Carlisle, who had been appointed as the Lord Proprietor of the Islands in the West Indies. Now, this would have been contrary to the policy of Sir William Courtin, who had not distributed any land to the initial settlers that had come because Courtin wanted them to work the land and then out of that, they would get some of the profits and the land would remain in his control. Also, we learned that the settlers who arrived with Charles Worfelstone each occupied 100 acres of land in return for 40 pounds of cotton, which they would give to the proprietor annually. This, what this meant is that by 1638, that a total of 67,929 acres of land had already been allotted to just 707 people. And you would understand that with a, an island that is 166 square miles, that when you've already allocated 67,000 acres of land, that you have given a significant amount of land to a small portion of people. These considerably large pots of land later would have contributed um, to the unavailability of land and up to the present time, we are still faced with that situation. Now, what had happened is that the indentured servants I mentioned who came on that first settlement, they would have been promised land. But obviously, when the English settlers were accorded such large plots of land, there was none left to be shared between other people. Also, we do have to note the development of cash crops in Barbados. Um, that would have escalated, namely the tobacco, and then a little later on, the cotton. But what happened is that even as these crops developed, they found, this, the planters found that labor was scarce. It was fortuitous that this situation coincided with the social and the political conflict that was taking place in Britain at that point in time. And as things escalated in the metropole, it provided a solution for the desperate planters in Barbados. And Charles I was executed on January 30th, 1649, after his defeat in the Civil War. And this led to a lot of political upheaval in England. And so workers from the lower classes in Britain were eager to escape all of that political upheaval. And so they volunteered to become indentured servants in the West Indian colony of Barbados. In addition, when Cromwell invaded Ireland and defeated the forces at Drogheda in August, 1649, the punishment for military prisoners was transport to Barbados. And so this now started a flow of workers who wanted to come to Barbados. Therefore, Irish Catholics in Britain, after all of this upheaval, became the targets of religious persecution. What it did is it caused thousands of Irish Catholics to be Barbados that's the term, by Cromwell. So they were forcibly sent to Crom to Barbados or transported as some um, historians would say, would say to Barbados. Therefore, the white population, the white servant population in Barbados increased exponentially in the mid 17th century as the island then started to move towards sugarcane production. Initially, it was tobacco, and then you had cotton. But there was a complaint that the tobacco that was grown in Barbados really was not of a good quality. And so as the market became saturated in Britain, 
the planters here began to look for another means, another crop that they could earn money from. And so they turned to sugarcane. And as they did so, the need for workers would have increased, but they had a ready supply of servants who would have come from Britain through people trying to escape political upheaval and as well as Cromwell would have deported them to Barbados. Migration to Barbados, whether it was voluntary or forced, did not translate into the cessation of discrimination that was experienced by the Irish in Britain. And again, this is where we have to understand what was taking place because um, the Irish were under severe persecution in Britain. And if some of them felt that their escape point would have been to come to Barbados. Unfortunately, this did not happen. And when they came, they found that the same persecution they had in Britain, it was felt here in Barbados. It was reported that Irish servants who came here to work on contract experienced harsh treatment along with terrible living and working conditions on the plantations of Barbados. Moreover, Catholics, including clergymen, were marginalized by the governing planter class who were predominantly Protestant or Anglican Englishmen. And so the legislature in Barbados, while taking a neutral stance on the political conflict in England, instituted several legal measures to curtail the religious practices of Catholics here in Barbados. Jill, Jill Hamilton claims that while the Church of England or Anglicans thrived, the Roman Catholic religion in Barbados stagnated and it was due to the oppression it faced. Yet the tensions, interestingly, the tensions that arose between these two religious groups in early Barbados were primarily political and social rather than as a result of the fundamental theological disagreements that you would expect to find between two religious groups. And I would posit this evening that neither of these groups were fighting for the souls of men in early Barbados. Rather, they were fighting for ground socially and politically as they both tried to survive in Barbados. We are looking then at the tensions between Anglicans and Roman Catholics in Barbados in the 17th century. And the tensions that existed between these two groups stemmed from pre-existing discriminatory notions as well as military conflict. Some of the tensions had existed between these two religious groups since 1115, when Adrian VI used a papal bull to grant Henry II the right to conquer Ireland in order to declare the truth of the Christian faith to ignorant and barbarous Irish nations. And they quote, that's a quote. Furthermore, the English Protestants were said to have been revolted by the Catholic Eucharist doctrine and practice, which they felt equated to idolatry. Moreover, the invasion of Ireland by Cromwell and the subsequent discrimination against the Irish facilitated an increase in the tensions between the English and the Irish. And so the tensions that you had here in Barbados in the 17th century between the Anglicans and the Irish Roman Catholics really was not so much about um, religion, but it had to do with pre-existing um, notions that both sides had, and predominantly the discriminatory notions that the Anglicans held against the Irish. We must understand again that because of um, Cromwell's transport of some thousands of Irish people to Barbados, 
the Roman Catholic population in Barbados would have swelled. And so the Roman Catholic population in Barbados was composed primarily of white Irish indentured servants. On the other hand, the Anglicans or Protestant group represented the elite English, elite white English planter class. And so the indentured servants, the Irish indentured servants, were considered to be inferior in every sphere of the British society. And this opinion was taken to Barbados by the English settlers who had held those opinions for centuries. Along with the differences in their religious practices, it was primarily then the longstanding tensions and hostilities in English-Irish relations which escalated in the early Barbadian society, according to Beckles. He also indicates that the Irish were seen as social undesirables. It was said that they belonged to a backward culture. The Irish Catholics were also stereotyped as being disobedient, lazy, and aggressive. And Dunn reported and I quote, they were cordially loath by their English masters. But most importantly, the Irish were despised by the English Protestants because they refused to recant their Catholic, Catholic beliefs, which caused the Protestant planters to see them as the enemy. Fraser et al. noted that Indentured servants were a part of the Barbados society as early as 1627. So they are claiming they indeed arrived on that first boat. However, due to their anti-Irish beliefs, Barbadian planters initially did not want to import additional Irish servants into the colony. So on August 29th, 1644, they instituted, and I quote, an act for the prohibition of landing Irish persons. And this was meant to restrict the number of servants landing on the island, says Schomburg. This attempt failed, and Beckles argued that the reason it failed was because the Barbadian planters were ineffective had ineffective control over the servant trade. They really could not determine whether or not Irish servants were coming here. That was the decision of Lord Cromwell and whether or not the Barbadian planters like it, Cromwell was going to be sending those people here to Barbados. Now, this remember, it accounted for the continued transportation of indentured servants to the colony. And so the flow of indentured servants went on well into the 18th century. In 1667, Lord Willoughby wrote to the Privy Council in England. He was requesting additional labor, labor because now the sugar production was ramping up. And he indicated to the Privy Council that he preferred Scottish servants rather than the Irish men. And so English Protestant planters and Irish Catholic servants were forced to exist together in Barbados in the 17th century. But the tensions between them did not cease and they did not look for ways to mitigate the tensions that came between them. The discriminatory views about the Irish in early Barbados intensified as the transportation to Barbados of people from the lowest levels in the English and Irish societies increased. From about 1648 to 1745, Oliver Cromwell used Barbados as a place of exile for military prisoners, for the worst convicts, 
are those who were found wandering the streets without any means of support. And so Cromwell sent to Barbados widows, he sent orphans, he went and emptied the whorehouses and he sent those people here. He emptied the prisons and he sent those people here as well. And there was indeed an influx of prisoners who, of people, Irish people, who came to Barbados between 1648 and 1745. In 1648, Cromwell started to transport prisoners of war to Barbados. In 1649, he sent prisoners out of the Irish rebellion. In 1650 to 51, it was the prisoners of the battles of Dunbar and Worcester. And then in 1654, any pirates who were held on the high seas were sent here to Barbados as well. In 1655, the prisoners that were held at Tynmouth and Plymouth Castle were also deported to Barbados. And then there were the Scottish rebels who were sent here in 1667. And in 1685, you had prisoners who were taken after the defeat of the Duke of Argyll. And in 1745, it was said that this was the last set of um, prisoners that Cromwell sent, and it was Highlanders who were captured during the Jacobite Rebellion. And you can see that indeed Cromwell pulled from the lowest levels of society, and he would have sent those people here to Barbados. And so Spurlock claims that between 1640, the 1640s and the 1650s, there was a large number of men, women, and children who came to Barbados from England, Ireland, and Scotland. These were people who were Barbados or sent to Barbados involuntarily as indentured servant. And they, were, they had to serve between four and seven years when they were here. They were promised that at the end of it, they would get about 10 acres of land and they would be free to go. People were deported to Barbados by virtue of any crime. It didn't matter what you did. Whether if it was a petty crime, you were deported to Barbados. If it was politically motivated, you were sent to Barbados. And for capital crimes, you could also be sent to Barbados. And then there were some who fell into bad luck because they were out on the street when what was called the press gangs were looking for people to place on the ships and people were literally kidnapped and sent here to Barbados to work as indentured servants. Now, the group of Irish Catholics who came to Barbados became a part of the population known as the red legs or the poor whites. The marginalization that they encountered in early Barbados led to their social and economic condition deteriorating to such a level that, and I quote, in 1689, the governor of Barbados, Colonel James Kendall, described the red legs as being dominated over and used like dogs. And so this gives you an idea of how the Irish Catholic were treated when they came here to Barbados and how they eventually turned out. Eventually, the red legs or the poor whites, um, they retreated from the wider Barbadian society and they were primarily found in the parishes of the East Coast, such as St. Philip, St. John and St. Joseph. There is evidence of them being in these um, different communities and because the community of Rices in St. Philip serves as evidence of their existence. It is actually named after Nicholas and George Rice. And um, these, these gentlemen were Irish Catholics who came to Barbados in the 1660s they were accorded some land and they were able to make money. And when um, they died in the 1660s as well, 
they left instructions that some of their fortune was to be utilized in building a hospital and as well to give the monies to, to some of the poor whites here in Barbados. Shepard also notes that in as early as 1662, other benefactors provided bequests to assist the poor white community as they slip further into poverty. And so the Irish Catholics in Barbados experienced tension with the English Protestants due to the long-standing negative opinions that the Anglicans held of the Irish. The Irish servants were also subjected to poor working and living conditions and they had no means of recourse. They had nobody to turn to, to complain to. And so their condition deteriorated further and further as African in, um, enslaved people came to Barbados. Some of the jobs that they would have done during the early part of Barbados also went away. And so you had a community of people who were descended from the original um, group of people who came here as Irish indentured servants and their, their condition was not a good one in the earlier part of our history. And now I want to look at the tensions between the English Protestants and the Irish Catholics um, as they continue to establish religious practices in early Barbados. Uh, the contrast between the advancement of Anglicanism and Roman Catholicism is glaring. For a while, the development of the Anglican Church in Barbados can be considered uneventful. The emergence of the Roman Catholic diocese on the island was fraught with challenges. The advent of the Anglican Church in Barbados was as a natural progression of the colonization of the island by Protestant authorities. And so Anglican clerics, Rees and Clark Hunt aptly described the ease with which the Church of England, which is also the Anglican Church, had its genesis in Barbados. And they affirm, and I quote, the history of this diocese starts with no romantic missionary page. It has known nothing of persecution, end of quote. And so of the when the Anglican church started in Barbados, they did not have to fight to get the church started. There was no persecution. There was no hindrance. They were able to set up things and it ran from there smoothly. Prado further clarifies that Barbados is considered the most Protestant of the colonies in the West Indies because it has never been occupied by the French or the Spanish. And the French and the Spanish would have been the ones to bring the Catholicism to um, the region. But since Barbados never was inhabited by the French or the Spanish, we only had Protestism from the English, we only had Anglicanism because it was the English who colonized Barbados. And so Dayfoot asserts that the Earl of Carlisle did not fully, did not fulfill his responsibility for the religious needs of the fledgling population in Barbados. And the Earl of Carlisle had been given um, responsibility for the island of Barbados early on. But historians note that the Earl of Carlisle really was not interested in religion in Barbados. He was interested in making money. He was interested in ensuring that the cash crops got started and so on, and that he personally would be able to make some money. And so there would be establishment of the church was neglected for two years after those first settlers arrived in 1627. It was actually Carlisle's first governor, William Tufton, who not only set about organizing the governmental structure for the colony, but he also implemented the institutional framework for the Anglican church. It was through him that the first six parishes of the island were outlined. 
And this was followed by the construction of churches and the establishment of vestries, which took care of the business of the church and of the community as well. And so it was Tufton who came and said, we need to have a church in Barbados. And so he put together the framework. They started to build the, the actual um, sanctuaries and they established the vestries and the vestries were run by the planter class, by um, these Protestants. And they were the ones who bought everything for the church, who undertook the building, the, the construction of the buildings. They bought all the furnishings and so on. And they were the ones who also looked after the poor in society and so on. And so it was that six churches and several chapels were built between 1630 and 1640 to accommodate the growing congregation of English Protestants. In 1641, Philip Bell um, was appointed as the Lieutenant Governor of Barbados. And he, it was during his tenure, which was a decade, that the parishes were expanded to 11. Along with this, a law was enacted making the Church of England the established Church of Barbados. So in 1641, the Anglican Church or the Church of England became the established Church of Barbados, and this was through an act of law. Along with the buildings, the um, Anglican Church in Barbados received a steady increase of clergymen beginning in 1637. So they were able to get clergymen to come from England and to serve here in Barbados. By 1641, there were 10 ministers assigned by the vestries to serve the 10,000 congregants who were now followers of the Anglican Church in Barbados. The number of clergymen increased steadily. And so by 1660, there were approximately 30 ministers who had migrated to Barbados unhindered to serve the Anglican Church. So the Anglican Church in 17th century Barbados progressed with ease. They had no troubles, they had no hindrances. The planters you see who made up the vestries found no opposition to the construction of their churches and chapels. In addition to this, they facilitated the acquisition of priests from the metropole to serve the growing congregation, ensuring that Anglicanism gained ground and became the dominant religion in early Barbados. In contrast though, in contrast to the founding of Anglicanism in Barbados, Roman Catholicism was subjected to several discriminatory measures that hindered its progress for centuries. Without priests to instruct and minister to the adherents, uh, without priests to instruct and minister to the adherents, along with the lack of buildings where congregants could meet to worship, the Roman Catholic faith was doomed to stagnation. Because really if, um, and you know what, speaking from experience, if there is no place for the people to go, and if there's no one to teach them, then you will get stagnation within that religious body. And this is what happened with the Roman Catholic Church. Accordingly, Sharox claims that there was no recorded evidence of the Roman Catholic Church in Barbados before the 18th century. Note that these Irish Catholics came here from the early 17th century, but there is no record of the church in Barbados before the 18th century. This assertion is supported by Jill Hamilton and she posits, and I quote, it is not certain when the Roman Catholic religion was first practiced in Barbados. Additionally, Edward Stout writing um, in a column in the newspaper contended that the Roman Catholic faith was the last of the first denominations that were on the island in the 17th century 
to erect a church building. Uh, they really were hindered from doing that work. The centenary publication of St. Patrick's Cathedral um, claims that Catholics were among the first settlers who came to Barbados. A writer, however, states, and I quote, apparently, however, there were no priests among them, end of quote. In an incident that was reported concerning the feuded, feuding Carlisle and Courtine factions in 1628, it is suggested that at least one priest was present since the early days of the colony. It is noted a battle was imminent when one Kent Lee and a clergyman rushed between the opposing parties and prevailed upon them to submit their differences to the authorities at home. But there is no certainty that this Kent Lane was um, an Ang whether he was an Anglican cleric or if he was a Roman Catholic cleric. Nevertheless, the expansion of the Roman Catholic Church in early Barbados was hindered due to the constraints of the Roman of due to the um, constraints that the clergy was subjected to. There is historical evidence which has established that there was significant intolerance of Catholic clergy in Barbados in the 17th century. And Jill Hamilton highlights how Catholic priests were ostracized by the Protestant governing elite. She contends that when a French priest landed in Barbados from Martinique with intentions of spreading the faith, he was promptly deported. She also refers to a law passed in 1650 that prohibited any form of worship except that established by England, in England by Queen Elizabeth I. And so the priests, the clergy in Barbados, the leaders of the church were prohibited from even coming to the island. And this would have indeed hindered the progress of the Roman Catholic Church and it would have stirred up tensions between the Anglicans and the Catholic. Leadership of the Catholic Church was stymied because many of the priests who were banished to the colony by Cromwell died gradually due to the harsh treatment that was meted out to them in Barbados. And Father Sharrox indicated that on their arrival in the colony, special orders were given Special orders were given for harsh treatment of these, um, of the priests who were to be sold as white servants for seven years. So the Catholic priests, priests were not treated like the Anglican priests. The Anglican priests were allowed to come and they were allowed to minister to the Protestant flock. But the Catholic priests were even hindered from coming and it was told to the people and that um, to the people look, treat them harshly. Consequently, Catholics in Barbados were without a resident priest until the 19th century. Now, while the progress of Anglicanism was assisted by the increasing number of churches on the island in the 17th century, the Catholics remained without a place of worship. Evidence of this is provided in several historical accounts. Catholic historian Allen, Edward Allen contends that Biet, a Catholic minister who visited Barbados in the 17th century, found no place for Catholics to practice their religion. Therefore, it is conjectured that the Roman Catholic priests held mass and gave the sacraments to their congregants in secret meeting places such as Indian Cave and Chapel Cave, both of which are located in the north of the island. These are plausible locations because, as Proto concluded, most Catholics were concentrated in the northern part of the island. And here you have an image of the Indian cave in St. Peter, where the Catholics were relegated to there to have their services. This is um, the actually the cave, the Location of the case is substantiated by Sinclair, who cited a case of three 
priests who secretly landed in Spikestone in 1654 to minister to Irish servants who were located on plantations in St. Lucie and St. Peter. And it is felt that they would have had to meet within that cave as well. Batson's, Batson situates Indian Cave approximately one and a half miles from Six Men's Bay, which would have made it a convenient gathering place for people in that locality. The presence and location of this cave was also confirmed by a longstanding St. Peter resident who had actually entered the cave and who saw how the inside of it looked. And so she wrote a letter which is housed in the Barbados Museum um, Library, the Shieldstone Memorial Library. And there you can see the handwritten letter of the M. Winter stating that indeed this cave does exist. Other unconventional locations were utilized by the Catholics um, for their meetings and you have Monsignor Vincent saying in a lecture he was giving that many early Catholics like the Irish would use the drill hall garrison as a venue for worship. And this would probably have been the troops that were stationed there who were Irish Catholics and who would have wanted to um, have some worship as well. While the construction of Anglican churches began within two years of colonization of Barbados, it took the Roman Catholic Church over two centuries to complete their first building. And so we see that how different the two experiences were and why there would have been tensions because while it took just two years for the Anglican Church to begin building buildings and having their structures and so on. The Catholic Church had to wait for 200 years before they could construct the first church. And this first church was the St. Patrick's Roman Catholic Cathedral on Jemmons Lane. And that church was actually opened on St. Patrick's Day, March the 17th in 1848. Davis contended that the Roman Catholic population in Barbados remained small due to, and I quote, the strongly Protestant heritage of the country. He noted as well that in the 1871 census, only 513 Roman Catholics were recorded as living on the island. This number only increased to 816 by 1891. And so even up to the 19th century, you see that the population of Roman Catholics in Barbados was still small. The Protestant planters that comprised the vestries of, Anglic of the Anglican church were unhindered to increase the number of priests and to construct churches and chapels. At the same time, the same um, people who were in those vestries prohibited additional Roman Catholic priests from entering the colony to minister to the people, their flock and to, and they did not allow the followers to erect churches for places of worship. And so people had to resort to going to the caves and so on. Hamilton therefore laments that while Protestants had freedom to practice their religion, Roman Catholicism was stifled due to the persecution. With all of that being said, there is yet more that would bring tension between these. And I will quickly address these as we um, come to a conclusion. Along with the hindrances that the priests had, the Anglican planter class in Barbados also implemented legal measures to undermine the progress of um, the Catholic Church. And these were with laws and acts that were implemented in Barbados. And several of these laws and acts um, were introduced by the Barbados legislature in early Barbados to oppress the Irish indentured servant in Barbados. And this is why tensions would have increased between the Anglicans and the Catholics as the Anglican church in Barbados used 
its power to discriminate against the, the Catholics. Davis says, and I quote, the established Anglican church functioned quite conspicuously in pursuing a general policy of social containment and of maintaining a web of dependence which the plantation ethic produced. And so in early Barbados, the Anglican church was not just a religious entity, since its membership included the governing elite planter class, it also served as a strong political organization that practiced religious tolerance. It was well known that Barbados in its early days was not particularly tolerant of religious freedom. So anybody who did not identify with the Protestant denomination um, experienced some level of religious persecution. And this was confirmed by a group of Irish Catholics who left Barbados in the 17th century and sought refuge in Hispaniola. And they testified before a Spanish tribunal that the English persecuted them by taking away their rosaries. They prohibited them from serving, from observing their hours of prayer as well. And Campbell argued religion permeated politics and the church was in turmoil. The time was past when the individual had the clear cut choice between the established church and Roman Catholicism. There, the Protestant ruling class used its political power to discriminate against the Roman Catholic church. They, pass laws, they pass acts to make sure that the Catholics in Barbados could not advance. And so Catholic historians assert once again that the reason there are no records of the Catholic religion in Barbados before the 18th century was in part due to the passage of a law in 1650, which prohibited any worship except that of the Church of England. We also had where when indentured servants arrived in Barbados from England in 1656, even with the priests and the schoolmasters, they were not greeted warmly. And there were specific orders that were issued that said, and I quote, they were to be treated with severe sternness and stringency. Hamilton also says, that the government was actively suppressing the advancement of the Roman Catholicism in Barbados because they felt it was a threat to the community. Further to this, in September 18, 1689, after Colonel James Kendall replaced Edwin Steed as governor of Barbados, he was expressly instructed by the new sovereigns, William and Mary, that liberty of conscience is to be granted to all except the papists. The Roman Catholic clergy then experienced discrimination and persecution constantly, consistently as they tried to serve the Irish Catholic adherents in the country. And this was also for the regular citizens of Barbados where strict controls were implemented. And even to hold a position in the government, you had to renounce your Catholic beliefs. And in February 8, 1678, there was an act that was put in place and anyone who wanted to serve in public office had to recite the following. I, a or B, do declare that I do believe that there is not any tra transubstantiation in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper or in the elements of bread and wine at or after the consecration by any person whatsoever. No Catholic would make this declaration, so they were effectively excluded from public life. Along with this, there were several other anti-Irish laws that were introduced to deal with the considerable number of Irish freemen and servants and others as are of the Romish rules. These laws were implemented in a time when 
the relationships between the masters and the Irish servants were deteriorating. And as a result, there was rebellion within the Irish Catholic camp. After this, stricter rules were put in place, but they did not survive because the Irish just um, were more secretive about what they were doing. And so the four point plan that Governor Searle put in place to control the Irish in 1655 came to naught because the Irish were unwilling to conform to these rules. And Governor Searle had said that Irish servants could not leave the plantation where they live without a pass, a ticket or a testimonial. And if they did not have it, they could be arrested by any religious person and handed over to a constable and they could be whipped or they could be put in prison. Uh, the firearms and ammunitions could not be sold to Irish servants and they could not be found in the possession of Irish servants. And as well, uh, they were subjected to arrest and they could have a year of labor on a plantation if Irish servants were found wandering about the island without a plausible reason. This might sound familiar to some people because what happened is that these laws which they tried to institute for the Irish in 1655 later became um, what we know as the slave codes and it started with the Irish Catholic and the, the um, attempt of the ruling um, Protestants to control them. There was a reprieve for the Roman Catholics in Britain in the 19th century, but it was not experienced in Barbados. For you see, but the Barbadians intended to rule themselves and they were not willing to listen to what England had to say. And therefore, you had a demonstration of the indifference with which the Barbados ruling power viewed the political leadership. It also showed the power of the Anglican governing class in Barbados and their ability to use that power to hinder the growth of the Roman Catholic Church. As I conclude, I would say there was a great amount of tension between Anglicans and Roman Catholics in Barbados in early Barbados. However, it was not primarily a fight over the souls of men, but it was a fight to gain social and political ground. However, it was an uneven fight because the Anglicans always had the advantage. First of all, they were the ones who came here first and were able to establish a political base in the country. Then the church and state in early Barbados were inextricably linked as it was the governing planter class who threw the vestries in the church really levied control over the island. And then the Roman Catholics, on the other hand, were disadvantaged and at the mercy of the Anglican ruling class. So while the Catholics were restricted the Anglicans flourished and became the dominant religion on the island while the Roman Catholics fought to survive, but they refused to relinquish their religious ideals. And I'll end with this interesting point. Catholic historian Edward Allen comments that it is ironic that some of the beliefs and practices of Roman Catholics, which had been scorned by the Anglicans, were now being practiced by them. He particularly mentions the transubstantiations and the prayers for the dead, which he says are now accepted in Anglican practice. In the article, he claims, or rather in an article by Father Taylor, he claims that the Catholic and Anglican style of worship have become similar. And so, the two really, you can't tell a big difference. And Father Taylor points to areas such as the title of father, which is now used in the Anglican church, which was previously denounced by the Anglicans. And he argues, and I quote, once it was the Catholic churches that abounded in externals such as candles and statues. 
as we have tended to remove them, Anglicans have installed them. So there were indeed tensions between Anglicanism and Roman Catholicism in early Barbados. These churches, however, were not fighting for the souls of men. They were fighting for social and political ground. The Anglicans were fighting for control as they were the ones who um, had political power in the island. But the Roman Catholics were fighting for their survival and to be able to um, have their church progress. That concludes my presentation this evening. Thank you, the Reverend Calendar, for an outstanding, excellent lecture. And I know that um, in a different space, you all would have stood up and give you a, a, a rousing round of applause. So I know the audience will join me in thanking you for this excellent lecture. And um, I suspect that they would want to further engage you in um, asking you a few questions and even um, yeah, sharing some comments with you. So a bit of housekeeping before we engage in that process. Um, please place your questions in the Q and A icon rather than inside the chat. Um, and those, please keep your questions as brief as possible. And for the persons on live stream, you can place your questions in the Facebook comment. And these questions will be relayed to the presenter. Um, so as soon as you have your questions ready, you can pose your questions to the Reverend Calendar. So as the audience are gathering their thoughts and their questions, you know, initially I, I didn't plan to um, ask any question, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll ask this question. Um, yeah, I, I think that the, yeah, I, I would like to hear your take on the, Reformation, because I think this provides the the kind of background to this tension. Um, so the Reformation, would you say, was a, a religious schism, or would you say that it was a political schism, or would you say that it was a religious and political schism? Because you know the 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 the, the battle between the the Protestants and the Catholics inside of Europe. Um, this was a, a serious battle and it took on serious um, political undertones because um, they, for example, the British use the, the, the religious aspect to breach Spain's monopoly inside of the Caribbean. And there was a sense of this kind of patriotism and even religious dimension when it was felt that if you attack Spain, for example, Spain was Catholic and you were killed, that right away you had a place in heaven because you were carrying out this, this religious duty. So uh, can you shed a little light on this for me, please? Uh, you, you are talking in terms of how it relates to um, what you know, what attained in Barbados in the 17th century? Correct. All right. Um, no, it really is similar, but yet different because when Martin Luther nailed those um, 95 theses on the door of the church, his intention really at that time was to have, um, have the, the, church at that time considered the fact that you know salvation is true faith and he having now had this revelation wanted the church to embrace that revelation and not to continue along the line that they were going uh, of course 
Um, everything takes on a life of its own at some point in time. And that happened with the Reformation too, but really in, in his, um, you know, in the, the, the purest senses, the Reformation really was a religious, a religious um, thing and more so than a political conflict. Yes, at some point in time, it was used in that way, but initially the, um, that is what it was about. Um, in this case, though, when we look at the, the church in Barbados at, in the 17th century, you do not see a lot of that um, religious, um, you know, a, a lot of that religious conflict coming out. Yes, they talked ab about the fact of the Eucharist and the fact that um, the, the Catholics felt that when you took the bread and when you took the wine, it really became the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And the Protestants did not have that same, um, you know, they did not have that same belief. And that was one of the bones of contention that really caused tension within the, the Catholic and Anglican churches in Barbados in, this, in the 17th century. But when you probe a little deeper, you see that it went beyond that. And it really became a political issue in that the legislature and council in Barbados were really fighting for autonomy and that anything they could do to maintain control over the island, that they were willing to do so. And if it meant that they had to restrict the Catholic church in order to keep control of the island, then they were willing to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'm not seeing any questions in the Q and A. Um, Right. Well, we actually um, have a question on Facebook. Um, so Michelle Springer asks, does the research throw up evidence of discrimination of any other marginalized religious groupings? Yes, but those will be handled in other in the other lectures coming up. So yes, we see with the Vesians and other groups. And those are other lectures within the series that will be coming up in the following weeks. So she can tune in to hear about those, but I would not want to go into somebody else's territory this evening. And we also have um, Jerry Blenman has his hand up. Um, so what we can probably do is just allow him to actually ask the questions. I'll just give him that permission. Yes, Jerry, you can go ahead, I think. You, you are unmuted, so you can ask the, the question. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Right, I just wanted to compliment this as an uh, excellent lecture. And the question relative to the impact on other religious groupings, you've already clarified, uh, will be looked at uh, in the in future lectures. So that's absolutely uh, fine. We'll await the, um, the presentation from those coming up. Yes, please. Thank you. Do we have any 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 more any more questions? Okay, it seems that we have another question from Alfred Taylor. So I'm gonna go ahead and allow him to talk. Hi, good evening. Let me com compliment um Robert Joel Calendar for a great, great presentation. My question is this though, um, the red eggs as we call them, the descendants of those early Irish Roman Catholics, are they still Catholics today? If you, if you look at the demographic of the today's Catholic Church, can they trace that lineage back to the early Irish Catholics? 
Yes, I, I actually um, spoke just last week with um, someone I know who is a descendant of the, um, the Irish Catholics who came here. And while he is not a practicing Catholic, he does assure me that some of his family members are indeed still, um, you know, Catholics and they're, they're still a part of the Roman Catholicism um, religion. So yes, some of them are still practicing as with any other group. Um, some of those people would have gone into different religious groupings, but for some of them, yes, they are still um, practicing Roman Catholics. Okay, thank you for that answer. And while I have you, Mike, can I just make one other observation? Um, in your presentation, you get the sense that there was a almost a fight for space, but between the Anglicans and the Roman Catholics, but it was clearly no contest. Um, because the point is that church and state were essentially the same thing. Um, it wasn't like the, the Anglican church came to Barbados literally as part of the colonizing exercise. So church and state um, were inextricably linked, as you said, but more than that. Uh, church and state was both um, religious and political. And the residual of that is, is, is in, we still have parishes today. And that comes mm -hmm. literally from the parishes set up by the church. The vestry was very much in control of everything in the parish. And very often the Anglican priest was the chairman of the vestry. Mm -hmm. So church and state was pretty much one entity back then. So the Romans really had no chance. Yeah. And the other thing observation I would make is that it was all about money. I mean, the whole colonization venture was about, it was an economic exercise of which the Anglican church, I have to say, was part. Um, and anybody else was part of the labor force in that economic machine, including the Irish Catholics sent here. And of course, the enslaved Africans that would come a little bit later. But thank, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Thank you, Mr. Taylor, very much for your contribution. And yes, I agree with you. And I think in my summation, I, I did indeed say that really it wasn't a contest. There was no fight um, because you can see that the, the Anglicans um, really exercised the power because of their relationship with the state. And um, that came out to me very forcefully in terms of the re um, research that was done. I'm seeing a, a, a comment here in the question and answer, which is indeed very flattering. So I, I'll, I'll read it. Um, it is saying very clear, so no need. So, so no real need for questions so, um, by Jean Bryce. So um, yeah, I think you should take that. Compliment. Um, any any questions coming from your end? Um, I, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, we have a question from Clive. Um, St. Patrick's RC Cathedral in Barbados, rebuilt in 1899, was supposed to have been designed by Peter Castellino. Castellini was a Jesuit priest who first went to British Guiana. Um, St. Patrick's is supposed to be his last building. Anything recorded in Barbados? Um, I did not see that in the writings. Actually, um, there, there is information. I, I do have it here. Let me tell you concerning the um, how the Roman Catholic, the design of the Roman Catholic Church. And it was actually by... Um, someone within the, the um, it was by one of the soldiers, one of the troops that was stationed here um, that designed the church. But what I can tell you is that the um, Roman Catholic Church has some excellent publications and you can actually purchase um, those from the, the church on Gemmets, um, Gemmets Road. So I would encourage you if you are interested in knowing more about the Roman Catholic Church, that you could go there to St. Patrick's Roman Catholic Cathedral in Gemmets Lane, and you can purchase their centenary publication, which has excellent information concerning the construction of that church. 
Right, I, I have a question here from an, an anonymous attendee. And the, the question is, would you please speak a little more about the vestry system? Was this used in other British islands? Um, I, I cannot answer that question because um, I really did not research that part for that part of it. Um, I mainly focused the research on what was happening between the, the Irish and the, um, the Anglicans. Uh, I know that the vestry system was used here in Barbados, not only for um, taking care of the church itself, as I would have mentioned earlier, there were the ones who um, oversaw the construction of the churches, they purchased the furnishings, and they were the ones who um, brought in the priests and so on for the churches. Also, they had a very good community-based program where they were the ones who took care of the poor, the needs of the poor. And actually, there is mention made of the vestry system um, supportive of the red legs or the poor whites in Barbados that when um, the poor whites really became, um, you know, the um, poorest group in society, it was to the vestry that they looked and that that vestry system provided for them very well. And to, it's to that extent that I can answer your question. Well, thank you on their behalf. Um, do we have any more questions, please? Yes, so we have a question by David Gibbs on Facebook. He asks, was there a difference in the way the Anglicans and the Catholics related to the Black population? Uh, Actually, yes, there, there was, because the Anglicans refused to uh, allow, well, rather refused to see the um, African population as being worthy of salvation. And initially, in the, the period that we are discussing today, they would not uh, minister to the African population. They would not allow them into the church. However, the, the Catholics were a little bit more lenient, but remember um, for a large point of the time under consideration, they really had to do any of their ministry in secret. And so there is not much to tell us how the Catholics related, but the, the, from the literature I read, it was a better than the way the Anglicans related to the um, African population. And again, in some of our upcoming lectures with some of the other religions that came, you will see the big difference, the disparity in how some of those other religions, especially the Quakers, how they're related to the African enslaved population versus how the Anglican church would have related to that population. And even one of the things that stands out very much in terms of the Anglicans is in the renting of the, the seats in the church and the fact that that um, you know, really spoke of the standing in the society. And so it was the rich planters and it was the governors and so on who bought the best seats and the seats at the front of the church. And um, the colored people only later on were allowed to be seated in the back of the church or really the seats um, that were counted as unworthy. So when you do the research, you see that coming out and it tells you the relationship between the Anglican church and the African enslaved population in Barbados. Do we have any more questions, please? Um, we have another question by Michelle Springer. She asks, do the descendants of the Irish Catholics have any memories or stories of these Catholics? Do they have any memory, memories or stories of, I didn't catch the end. Of these past tensions. Yes, they do. And um, there is actually um, quite a bit of information in terms of, again, the, the red legs and so on of our society. There is an interesting article in Irish America where the, the you know, descendants are traced and there are photographs and everything. So I would encourage you to go online. The article 
is online and you can see um, photographs of those people and you can read their stories. They're actually stories of um, what they went through. Jill Shepard, uh, whom I quoted earlier, has written a wonderful article that article online concerning um, the Irish in Barbados and in terms of um, the photographs and so on is called the Irish of Barbados and it is found on Irish America. In addition, Jill Shepard has written a historical sketch of the poor whites in Barbados from indentured servants to red legs. And that writing gives you um, significant information concerning these descendants of the Irish um, Catholics here in Barbados. Okay, great. And I'm seeing one last question here to slide. Um, were there any Scots Presbyterian churches in Barbados? Using Diana as comparison, the, uh, someone else just dropped in the question, so it's like, okay, not the Scots. Okay, I'm going to start over again. Were there any Scots? to the Presbyterian churches in Barbados using Diana as comparison, the previous Presbyterians and the Moravians were established by the 1840s. Again, I think we have those coming up in um, future lectures. So what I would encourage you to do is to tune in and um, listen for what will come out in the lectures that are upcoming as we look at religion and so on in the society in Barbados. Okay, um, I, I have one question and I think this will be the, the, the last question. Um, and this question is not to Reverend Calendar, but it is more um, towards the officials at the Barbados Museum. And the question is, will the recording of this session be available online or afterwards? So um, I, can you take that question or not, not your Reverend calendar? Right. So I, I guess somebody from the museum society would have to answer that question. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So right now the lecture is actually being recorded. So what we're going to do is that after this, we are going to put it on our YouTube channel. Um, and for those who are joining us on Facebook, the video will be available after the night has finished as well. Um, so if you're looking for the video, you can go on YouTube, you can search for the Barbados Museum Historical Society, and you will be able to find the video. Um, it probably won't be up tonight, but it'll probably be up um, maybe tomorrow or so, um, and you'll be able to rewatch it and listen to Robert Calendar's um, presentation again. Okay, then I, I, I wish, therefore, to thank the audience for their, for being here and for their engaging questions and their comments. And I also wish to thank the presenter again, who not only can deliver excellent um, lectures, but yeah, also um, very good, very outstanding in responding to the questions. So I will say that we are off to an excellent start inside of this series. I hope that you will attend the upcoming lectures. Next week, we would have the topic of Judaism in Barbados from the 17th century by Dr. Carl Watson. And please note that you can join via Zoom using the same link. Um, so I, I want to thank you again, yeah, for being an excellent audience and for your feedback and your views. I thank you very much. So have a great, a great evening, a great night. I thank you. <laughs>